Hi, and welcome to another Access Chat. We're really pleased this week to have Ian Hamilton with us. Uh, first met Ian on, on Twitter, although I was aware of his work from um, colleagues that I've been in touch with at the BBC. Ian is one of the authors of the Game Accessibility Guidelines, and I think this is a really interesting area for us to explore, because gaming means such a lot to uh, the disabled communities. I spend a lot of time playing online games, um, some of the clans that I'm in and one that I ran actually had uh, a membership of around 100 and of that 100 people nearly 30% of them had some kind of disability or were directly related to someone with a disability. So gaming is a really important topic. Um, we've focused on the workplace for now but gaming is also a huge industry so uh, welcome in. Thank Hello. you for, for coming and talking to us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. So can you tell us a bit about um, what got you started around gaming accessibility and, and, and how you came to write the guidelines? Um, well, it's kind of more what got me started in accessibility in general. So I work in a, um, kind of a couple of other things, uh, web and cartography and that kind of stuff, but it's actually gaming that first got me interested. And it was from um, when I started working at the BBC, I was working on kids' content which is quite a lot of games and um, quite quite soon after I started I saw some playtesting footage of games that had been adapted for Switch accessibility. So this was kind of one button games for um, really, really profoundly disabled preschool children. And um, it's basically seeing that um, user testing footage of kids who, you know, like a generation ago would just have kind of been lying there being cared for. All of a sudden now because of this advance in technology they were just sat there laughing, playing, doing exactly the same kind of thing as all their classmates. So it's quite hard not to kind of get inspired by that. And then from there, went into um, working in web accessibility as well, and kind of seeing the, the, the gap in between web and games. Um, web's obviously quite quite far along compared to games. It's got um, industry standard practices and stuff which aren't really there in games. So that kind of again pushed me a bit to try and work on the guideline side and the advocacy and try and raise the bar a bit. And, and and the guidelines have been a, a, around for a little while now, and they're they're certainly um, much more concise than say the web accessibility guidelines. Um, and I, I think that's probably a good thing. Um, you need to start off small and get something that people can 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 buy into. Um, how how much you know, you've, you've been working on the advocacy side? So how much sort of uptake have you seen? Um, from from some of the studios and are there are there particular areas that have have, have grasped this earlier than others? Um, it's been pretty much across the board to be honest. Um, it's had a decent amount of traffic and it's been pretty much even split in between um, not game developers but also um, academia as well. So people um, working on postgraduate stuff in research papers as well as being linked to from um, VLEs, so turning up in course materials as well, which is really, really nice to see. Um, but from the game side as well, it's everything from um, small independent studios all the way up to the big publishers and manufacturers. Um, but it all, all sounds very good, but it, it's still kind of early days, so there are people looking at it, but it doesn't quite mean the standard practice across the industry yet, which is where we really want to get to. I, th I think that. I think you've got a massive challenge in that um, the way that games are presented are non-standard for for a start. You know, it's not like you you you're on the web and you have the familiarity of a browser interface and and, and lots of the stuff is the same and it's going to interact. And so, in, um, I think half of the innovation that's within the industry is finding new ways to interact. So therefore, um, you you're chasing after the uh, the innovation curve even more than we are on on the web when we're trying to make stuff accessible so i, I think yeah. it's a, it's a it's a tricky conundrum that you you've got faced there uh, yeah absolutely well that's the thing is in games it's, it has to be far more um, pragmatic than in web so for example on the accessibility guidelines site you've got it categorized into um, basic and intermediate and advanced um, which is very different to what you've got at WCAG's A, AA, AAA because it's not um, compliance levels. You know, like you're saying, there isn't just like a set level that you can aim for in games because each individual mechanic, each individual game is so varied. Um, the actual barriers within the game are completely different. So what's a really, really easy barrier to avoid in one game could actually be the complete core mechanic in another. 
And it basically comes down to what games actually are. So to meet the definition of game, there has to be some kind of rules and challenge, which is yeah. going to be some kind of a barrier. Yeah. And, and you've actually um, anticipated one of my questions, which, um, which was about the whole, um, you know, to a certain extent, lack of accessibility is part of the challenge of the game. Um, you know, you've got to figure out how to use it, how to interact, and, and the difficulty is part of the, the joy of the game. It's just that it's got to be difficult, not impossible, right? Absolutely. Well, it's all about basically what constitutes a necessary barrier and an unnecessary barrier. Yeah. But that varies from game to game. So one game, um, it might be all about like really difficult cognitive kind of stuff, you know, playing some kind of strategy game. Um, another game might be all about hand-eye coordination. Um, but that's the thing, if you've got a game that's about hand-eye coordination, it's not about being able to distinguish colour, it's not about being able to distinguish things by sound. So there's always, in every game that's ever come out, there's always so many unnecessary barriers that could have, that could have been avoided. Deborah, I know you had a question. I have a thousand questions for Ian on this topic because I think it's such an interesting topic. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll narrow it down to just a few questions. But I, uh, one of the one of the questions I have are: Are you seeing developers with disabilities getting it um, more engaged in the conversation? And and are you finding that some of the mainstream developers of games are paying it more attention to this? It seems to me that they are, but I, you know, I focus so much on accessibility that it might be I'm just really hyper vigilant to the topic. So um, I'll just start with those two questions. Sure. Okay. So first one, um, uh, not so much. There's, um, I mean, the diversity side is 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 not so much my area, but but the little that I do know is that. Um, the games industry in general has still got a fair way to go with diversity, not just with um, people with disabilities, but um, gender and, and backgrounds and all kinds of stuff. Um, but on the plus side, though, um, the uh, developers in studios with disabilities are actually becoming more aware of accessibility. So that's something really interesting that I've seen is, is even, you know, you've got, got a um, developer who's colorblind, who it never even entered their head that you could actually make a game that's colorblind friendly. So as general awareness is growing, that right. means that, that within the studios are gaining that awareness too. And there's another nice example. There's another guy who worked on the um, uh, guidelines work for a studio called Headstrong. And um, they have a um, deaf developer. And he said that previously, um, you know, in years gone by, he'd never actually wanted to speak up about accessibility issues because he didn't want to be, you know, the, the one person whinging in the corner. But... Again, as as awareness right. is starting to increase, he's feeling more comfortable talking about this kind of stuff. Okay. And so the, the second question was about the um, big companies, yeah? Um, so there are there yeah. are yeah. So there are a couple of things which have actually made it into requirements. So there's um, uh, Ubisoft in particular. They had um, it was the the very first Assassin's Creed game. They had all kinds of complaints from people about the lack of subtitles in the game. So they just made that a publisher level requirement after that. Every game that Ubisoft ever releases um, has to have subtitles. And again with Ubisoft there was a case a few years ago with a game called, um, what's it called, uh, Rabbids Rabbits. And um, a kid had uh, epileptic seizure while playing it. And this was actually in the UK, it went all the way to um, Parliament in the UK. And as a result, again, they've now introduced mandatory um, epilepsy testing across their games. Um, those, those kind of things are exceptions, though, so there isn't that much that's set at that kind of level, but the companies are taking more than notice, the big ones. And the really, really big thing has been um, colour blindness. So that's been really nice to see the last right. couple of years, awareness really, really growing around colour blindness. And, um, and it's been helped a lot, actually, by just getting a few big people who are doing it. The resulting um, media coverage of that results in much greater awareness. So you've had really big stories about... Um, Sim City and Battlefield and um, uh, Borderlands, you know, really, really big blockbuster console games who are actually thinking about color blinds. And we see uh, World of Warcraft last week as well. So those kind of things really do a huge amount to to let people even know that color blindness is a thing. So that's the biggest biggest barrier to accessibility in gaming at the moment it's, is just lack of awareness. People just haven't thought about it. I have a, a daughter that's 27 years old now. And she has Down. She was born with Down syndrome, and she's a big gamer. 
and yesterday she was playing a game on the Wii, and she she went through all eleven um, levels. I'm not a gamer, but she went through eleven levels. It took her about seven hours, and I kept trying to get her off of it to go do other things. And she said, you know, Mom, I think I should be a game tester. And I, I just think I love this topic because so many people are so interested in And it, it can tie into corporate training. and There's just so much opportunities there. But um, it, it's, it's interesting to think of a, a young lady with Down syndrome being a game tester it's really not that weird anymore, you know. It's really it's something that could happen. So um, I just am a very, very big fan of your work, and so I'm not going to mon monopolize you because I know Antonio has a question, but I'm just very impressed with what you're doing. And um, well, just something actually first on that, that topic you're saying about the engagement and trying to get her off it, um, that itself is a really, really <laughs> powerful. Um, so to give you an example, there was some. Um, uh, games that were working um, again, and this is some um, BBC games um, for quite profoundly uh, disabled um, young kids. We went out play testing. This was in people's homes, and this um, particular area of it was looking at um, switch accessibility. So we gone to do our um, recruitment, and um, and were recruiting people uh, with young kids who had switches. And turned out what that wasn't quite the right word. We should have said young kids who use switches. So we ended up going okay. to uh, one kid's house who the parents had got them like a large um, like pressure pad switch. Um, but this particular kid um, had really, really profound motor impairment and really profound um, learning disabilities as well. So not only um, was it really difficult and painful to try and operate the switch, they couldn't communicate to the child why they should go through that effort either. Um, so this kid couldn't use the switch at all and wasn't going to be able to test the game. Um, but um, the kid's dad thought, you know, it's, it's, it's got a TV character in it that the kid likes, so may as well just put the game on and see if they get anything from the experience anyway. Yeah. So, um, so the dad had had a kid in the lap and was um, playing the game for them. So there was the like the kid's hands and the dad's hand on top of the switch, just playing the game for them. And um, as the game went along, he said, "Look at that!" And the kid was just starting to stretch out their fingers and attempt to press the switch. And they they never done that before, you know. Obviously, that has so many implications for, for for that kid's future quality of life and everything. They just succeeded because it's a game, because of that engagement. You know, there's no need to explain anything. They just really, really wanted to do that simple cause and effect interaction and interact with a character on the screen. You know? uh, uh, yeah, uh, I I just I think it's amazing. I'm sorry, Antonio. I, as a parent, uh, my daughter has mastered games that. I could never do myself. So anyway, I'll stop. I just am so enamored by your work, Antonio. No, I, I, I was going to, to, to ask about the, the if there's space about uh, for to, to design games for people with accessibility with accessibility needs. Obviously, it's by what you're saying, Ian. There is. But what I would ask when you were in in the example that we're mentioning, uh, what type of people do you think it's needed? Uh, to have in the team designing this type of games, you know, I think you need people from different areas to be able to understand, you know, the whole environment where the kid is, and uh, how the, uh, how are you able to solve the challenges w when you face a, a situation like that? Um, so sorry, missed a bit of that. So you're asking about. Um, what, so when you what? are, you know, you were mentioning about designing uh, the, the kid uh, that was testing a game. Right, so uh, obviously, when it, when you are working on that, obviously there's a set of skills that is required, and you probably need uh, a team with different people working with you. What what type of uh, needs you think you need in terms of people and knowledge when you are trying to identify the challenges that those kids are facing when they want to play a game, for example? Um, well, this particular one, we did actually have um, some specialists involved. So we worked with um, speech and language therapists because the game was um, targeted quite heavily at um, uh, low functioning autistic kids. Um, but generally speaking, in, in terms of accessibility, it's, it's not so much about um, specialists, um, specialist people. If you've got an accessibility specialist to help, if you're also working to guidelines and if you're testing, between those three things, you should be able to do a good job. And I think it does touch all disciplines as well, whether it's design, development, production. 
Is that, is that kind of answer what you're yeah, asking? Uh, uh, but in, in, on the cognitive, cognitive side, are, are you uh, because some of those kids that they are being they are being followed probably by 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 someone, how do you have a, a complete picture of the profile of that of that person? In order to be able to to help him better. Um, with that, well. That's the thing. If it gets down, if it gets down to that kind of um, level of impairment, every kid is completely unique, so it's difficult to to have kind of personas and that kind of stuff involved. It's just got to be loads and loads of testing. So that's what we did all the way through that project from the very earliest stages. So be, be, before even you know even the proposal was written, just going and spending time in special needs schools, just observing low functioning autistic kids, and seeing kind of the effect their environment has on them, that kind of stuff, and then just round upon round of testing. So, so Ian, uh, I love I love the answer that you just gave to Antonio because what I heard you say um, is that you know every every single person is individual, and so I think that the gamers must be learning so much. Uh, like you said, the example of the young man with the switch, and even my daughter with Down syndrome, but the gamers, the designers, must be learning so much learning to include people with disabilities and and it, I guess it's like any other part of accessibility that as you do this like the example you're using also with the colorblind I think do, do you agree that it seems like there's an opportunity to make these games better for everybody because yeah, of the effort chart completely 100 percent agree because that's the thing that's, that's what it's about it's about um it's about removing barriers to enjoyment and what's a really big barrier for one person. It's probably still going to be a bit of a barrier for everybody else. Um, so, it, uh, just one example, because you mentioned color blindness. Um, there's a game called um, Burnout Paradise, which is a um, kind of free-form racing game. You have to uh, go around a map doing various different races. And there's different types of race, and each one is represented on the map by a different colored circle. So that means, obviously, it's impossible for somebody who's color blind to use the map. But it also means that it's a real pain for anybody else to use, having to try and remember what purple equates to and having to keep referring back to the key and stuff. So just adding icons, a perfect classic example, just adding icons on makes it better for everybody as well as allowing people who are colorblind blind to play. And that applies to, applies to so, so much. That's, that's what's nice about it is, especially if you're talking about in terms of the guidelines, actually showing people the guidelines and actually being able to look down the list and like, oh, I do do this, I do do this. That just makes sense. You know, because a lot of, so much of it is just good game design. Just people need to know just exactly why those things are important and they should keep on doing them. Okay, I've, I've got a slightly different take um, on sort of games accessibility and it's more around the benefit. It's not, it's not that what you said isn't valid, it absolutely is. Uh, it's, it's, I'm thinking about the benefits that, that things like multi -massive, massively multiplayer online games are bringing, you know, the, the, the fact that you are developing communities. A bit like we've got communities on Twitter, but you've also got communities in, in, in games as well. And, um, I, I just see these, you know, affordances within these games to enable people to have social interaction, to have uh, support networks. That and, and I've watched it happen where you, you've got people that are looking out for people in these virtual worlds that they, they, they've never met, but they care. Um, and, and people are, you know, are having access that, that they, they wouldn't have outside of the gaming. So, so what you're doing is really important because if they can't get into the game in the first place, then, then they, they don't have access to the, that additional support work, that um, social interaction, and everything else. And people may mock it, you know, saying, "Oh, you're spending all your time in front of a in front of a screen." But um, if you were spending all of your time in front of the TV, you've not got that interaction. Yeah, that's the thing. Is is um, especially the virtual worlds they've got? They're really, really powerful. But all games in general, um, what they what they actually represent is like culture and recreation and socializing. Which, you know, that's not trivial or time wasting stuff. That's really, really important for people's quality of life. And because it's so technology focused, that lends itself naturally to accessibility. So it can be, you know, if you've got somebody who's got really limited means of accessing those things, games can be really important. And like we said about um just being sat in front of a screen as well, there's a nice quote about that from a guy called um Travis Taft, he's one of the writers for Able Gamers. Okay. Um, he was saying about his, it was an online virtual world. He was talking about um, World of Warcraft, and um, he was saying about having a difficult time adjusting to his, his condition and stuff after he, I think after he'd been in an accident. 
Um, but he said just for a couple of hours a day, you know, it wasn't just a screen, that was a portal. You know, for a couple of hours a day, he'd escape into that portal and no longer be Travis, the guy in the wheelchair. He was Vidal, the sly but good-natured troll hunter. Yeah. That's just, just allows people <laughs> to be themselves without being judged as well, you know? Uh, I think it's really important. I mean, the 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 power of imagination, but 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 also the you know that that taking it outside of your outside of your um, daily grind and and um, you know yes, it's it's escapism, but it's also it, it's escapism that has a powerful positive effect on people. Yeah, that's that's what I like about gaming in particular, is because so much of accessibility is just about kind of taking care of the basics that you need to get by, but Life isn't really about just kind of the basics you need to get by. There's other important stuff as well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Are you are you aware of um, any imp uh, important events, networking events, where uh, people uh, online or offline, where people can actually uh, address the topics that we are talking here? How can they find people like you can get in touch with other people working in the same space somewhere around the world, and and they can solve problems together? Um, there is um, the only, the only real place of that is the there's the IGDA which is the International Game Developers Association. They have an accessibility mailing list, um, so that's a good place to meet people. We've also started um, just recently getting some face to face things going. So we had some um, accessibility drinks in London last week, and we got some more coming up in America next week. So hopefully we can get that kind of thing on the go. Are you, are you going to see some right? Uh, Sorry. Uh, are you going to see so? Yeah. 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 I've got a few back to back. So at the same time as actually exactly the same time as CSUN, there's um, GDC, which is the Game Developers Conference, yeah. which is kind of the CSUN of the gaming world. It's huge. About twenty thousand people there. So that's on actually the same week as um, the same week as CSUN. So I'm quickly nipping in between the two. So what's the best way for people to connect with those groups if they are interested? Um. Uh, the, especially the ones that you mentioned that were happening recently. Um, recently, yeah. Well, it's it's only been it's only been one so far, but, um, but yeah, I think if you keep an eye on the um, uh, the IGDA's accessibility group mailing list, um, how to find it? We search for IGDA dash G A S I G. The snappy name. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you search for that, you'll be able to find the details of the main list, and that kind of stuff gets talked about on there. No, because I, I'm using tools like a, a Eventbrite or Meetup in order to advertise that. Yeah, so um, so the one there's one happening at GDC, which we've got a couple hundred people signed up for now. So that's Eventbrite. Um, the one in London wasn't advertised anyway. It's just kind of a few like, minded people to get getting together. Okay. Okay. There's actually an event tomorrow called E Access 2012. Uh, sorry, 2015. I'm a few years behind myself, um, <laughs> which which is interesting because it's 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 um, kind of government departments uh, sponsorship as well as uh, businesses. So I'm, I'm popping along. I don't think there's much in the way of of, of games talked about, um, but there is work going on with Department for Culture, Media and Sport, um, looking at e-accessibility, so I think it's perhaps something I'll keep an eye out for. Uh, yes, because you have stuff like there was the um, uh, e-accessibility action plan, which yeah. I think has kind of gone by the wayside a bit now, but that just kind of, it was great that games actually got a mention in there, but yeah. it was kind of a token mention, it really should be up there just as much, if not more, than other types of... Right, well, well the, the action plan is being, um, they're applying the defibrillators to it. <laughs> And, and and there is a working group and it is being sort of reformed. I think there was a you know a, a, a lot of there were a lot of stakeholders in the previous um, in the previous format that that made it kind of unwieldy. And um, I think that they've gone for a small steering group and then a larger consultation group this time round. Well, we'll we'll see how it how it pans out. But I think it's something that should be in there. Yeah, it, it has to be in there. Well, just in terms of the scale of the industry, so that, um, it's I think from the last year the games industry is um, 82 billion dollars a year. Just to put that in context, the um, cinema box office globally is 38 billion, so it's double the size of cinema. The global wow. music industry is 15 billion, 
to get to get a, to get a figure similar to the size of the games industry, you have to actually recruit include all film media. So if you add up the value of cinema, DVD, TV, um, TV, Netflix, add all those things together, you get the same size of the games industry. So it's huge. You know, industry of that scale can't be excluded from those companies. No, no, it's it's a massive industry. I don't think people really realise quite how big it is. Um, especially now that everybody's gaming on on these things and on you know it's casual gaming as well it's the access to to all of those other things because people don't don't necessarily think oh well bubble break is a game it's just yep. a thing that i do while i'm on the bus angry birds <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but if you're playing Angry Birds or Bubble Break for a couple of hours a day, you're, you're racking up a lot of time on that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, most likely, uh, if, if it's uh, Candy Crush, paying a fair bit. Yes. <laughs> Listen, Candy Crush, Candy Crush kills me. Like, Candy Crush, it's um, basically it's a by-the-book example of how you should design for colour blindness, because every piece of candy has got a unique shape yes. as well as a unique colour. Until you get late on in the game, they introduce the bombs and the eggs, which are differentiated by colour alone. And King's entire business model for Candy Crush is based on retention. You keep people playing for a long time and get repeat purchases out yeah. of them. And they're losing, they're losing the colourblind players when they get late in the game. And Candy Crush, the, um, the money that Candy Crush makes is measured in hundreds of millions of dollars per quarter. Yes. The amount of money they must be losing hand over your fist because of the design of those bombs and those eggs. Such a trivial little thing that must be costing them so much money. So frustrating to see. Yeah, I'd love to. We could, if you could think of a finger in the wind kind of figure, it would be really interesting. You could slice up the demographic, um, work out how much they're making on, on a quarterly basis, work out how many people couldn't play, and then you pretty much can calculate the loss. The, the yeah, that's something that's really interesting about games is you can do that kind of stuff in general. You know, there's so much in games is down to settings as well. You know, like yeah. you, can just, you can just track how many people turn subtitles on and how many people configure their controls, and actually get proper business case data out of it, which of course is notoriously difficult to get hold of in other industries. Yeah, yeah. And right. Think, Good. I think that's that's fantastic. I'd love to see some of that data. If you've got stuff you can share, we'll, we'll share it further. Um, I have a couple of examples. There are only a couple of little examples, but it's, it's really interesting, nice stuff. So, have well, you got some stuff around fonts? Um, oh, fonts, yeah. There was a, um, that was one. It was, oh, what's it called? The Last Door, which is a um, Lovecraftian uh, horror game. Yeah. And um, it's all done in um, kind of old school pixel fonts. Yeah. Uh, and they included, um, one of their developers is really into accessibility, and they included a um, dyslexia friendly font as an option. And all the first 150,000 people who played it through to completion, um, which is obviously decent kind of stats to, to, to get from, um, of that 150,000 people, 14% of them had chosen to play all the way through the whole game with the, the sexy friendly font turned on, which coincidentally That's or not cool. coincidentally is also the same figure of people who've got difficulty reading. Yeah. But another really nice example, I think, was um, one called. Um, Actually, two games, um, one called Mudrunner and one called Solara. They're iOS games that they made voiceover accessible. Um, Solara, um, it took the, it took him two days because it's a text-based game. And um, and he was hoping, you know, you get, you know, 1% of the population were blind, so he was hoping you get 1% of his players are blind, you know, but the figure he actually got back was 13%. So 13 times more than you would expect it because it's a niche audience. There aren't that many blind accessible games around, still so choosing to play the game. Yeah. And the other one, Solara, same kind of thing. This was a really, really visual strategy game, so it took a fair bit of work. It took um, about two weeks to get it working nicely with voiceover. Um, again, they tracked the data. Also, anyone working in any industry, um, any, uh, uh, if you're working on apps, there's one single line of code you can use. UI um, accessibility is voiceover enabled, and it'll tell you whether someone's using a screen reader and track it really easily in apps, which obviously you can't do on websites. Um, sorry, I digress. Right, so they tracked it in um, Solara, and the figure they got back was 1%, so it's pretty much bang on. Um, however, their business model is like Candy Crushers, it's free to play. Yes. So it's about in pe getting retention and people making repeat purchases. And they found out that 1% were far more loyal than anywhere else, anyone else, and spent far, far more on in-app purchase than anyone else. 
Yeah, we should. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, we we talk about the 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 business case. It's the fact that actually you're opening up a market, and and this is something that I know that Jonathan Hussell talks about. I know that Rich Donovan talks about it. We spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, internally, um, it's everyone chases after the accessibility business case. It's out there. It's good to have some, um, some really clear, um, up-to-date examples of, of how, by making stuff accessible, you're you're opening up revenue streams. Because I think, sadly, um, you, you have to talk about revenue streams when you're trying to engage certain certain parts of, of businesses because. Fair enough. Yeah. You, you you need to make money to survive. So so talk the language of business. Talk talk about the the opening up of new markets. I think it's really important. I think we've overshot our half hour because it's been fascinating chatting with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll just run it long. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's great. Um, I'm looking forward to the Twitter chat tomorrow night, and um, I wish you. Uh, a very productive shuttling backwards and forwards between GDC and CSUN. I think you're going to be absolutely wiped out. But uh, good luck to you doing both. So thank you once again for joining us. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you very Thanks, much. Ian. Thank you, Ian. Thank you.